Chapter 7. The Gospels. One story, many dimensions. As with the Epistles and Acts, the Gospels seem at first glance easy enough to interpret. Since the materials in the Gospels may be divided roughly into sayings and narratives, that is, teachings of Jesus and stories about Jesus, one should theoretically be able to follow the principles for interpreting the Epistles for the one and the principles for historical narratives for the others. In a sense this is true. However, it is not quite that easy. The four Gospels form a unique literary genre, for which there are few real analogies. The uniqueness, which we will examine momentarily, is what presents most of our exegetical problems. But there are some hermeneutical difficulties as well. Some of these, of course, take the form of those several hard sayings in the Gospels. But the major hermeneutical difficulty lies with understanding, the kingdom of God, a term that is absolutely crucial to the whole of Jesus's ministry, yet at the same time is presented in the language and concepts of first-century Judaism. The problem is how to translate those ideas into our own cultural settings. The nature of the Gospels Almost all the difficulties one encounters in interpreting the Gospels stem from two obvious facts. One. Jesus himself did not write a gospel, they come from others, not from him. 2. There are four gospels. The fact that the gospels do not come from Jesus himself is a very important consideration. Had he written something, of course, it would probably have looked less like our gospels and more like the Old Testament prophetic books, say, like Amos, a collection of spoken oracles and sayings plus a few brief personal narratives like Amos chapter 7 verses 10 to 17. Our gospels do indeed contain collections of sayings, but these are always woven, as an integral part, into a historical narrative of Jesus's life and ministry. Thus they are not books by Jesus but books about Jesus, which at the same time contain a large collection of his teaching. The difficulty this presents to us should not be overdone, but it is there and needs to be addressed. The nature of this difficulty might best be seen by noting an analogy from Paul in Acts and his epistles. If we did not have Acts, for example, we could piece together some of the elements of Paul's life from the epistles, but such a presentation would be meager. Likewise, if we did not have his epistles, our understanding of this theology based solely on his speeches in Acts would likewise be meager, and somewhat out of balance. For key items in Paul's life, therefore, we read Acts and feed into that the information he gives in his epistles. For his teaching we do not first go to Acts, but to the Epistles, and to Acts as an additional source. But the Gospels are not like Acts, for here we have both a narrative of Jesus's life and large blocks of his sayings, teachings, as an absolutely basic part of that life. But the sayings were not written by him, as the Epistles were by Paul. Jesus's primary tongue was Aramaic, his teachings come to us only in a Greek translation. Moreover, the same saying frequently occurs in two or three of the Gospels, and even when it occurs in the exact chronological sequence or historical setting, it is seldom found with exactly the same wording in each. To some this reality can be threatening, but it need not be. It is true, of course, that certain kinds of scholarship have distorted this reality in such a way as to suggest that nothing in the Gospels is trustworthy. But no such conclusion need be drawn. Equally good scholarship has demonstrated the historical reliability of the Gospel materials. Our point here is a simple one. God gave us what we know about Jesus's earthly ministry in this way, not in another way that might better suit someone's mechanistic, tape recorder mentality. And in any case the fact that the Gospels were not written by Jesus, but about him, is a part of their genius, we would argue, not their weakness. Then there are four of them. How did this happen, and why? After all, we do not have four Acts of the Apostles. Moreover, the materials in the first three Gospels are so often alike we call them the synoptic common view.
Gospels. Indeed, one might wonder why retain Mark at all, since the amount of material found exclusively in his Gospel would scarcely fill two pages of print. But again, the fact that there are four, we believe, is a part of their genius. So what is the nature of the Gospels, and why is their unique nature part of their genius? This can best be answered by first speaking to the question, why four? We cannot give an absolutely certain answer to this, but at least one of the reasons is a simple and pragmatic one, different Christian communities each had need for a book about Jesus. For a variety of reasons the gospel written for one community or group of believers did not necessarily meet all the needs in another community. So one was written first, Mark, in the most common view, and that gospel was rewritten, twice, Matthew and Luke, for considerably different reasons, to meet considerably different needs. Independently of them, again, in the most common view, John wrote a gospel of a different kind for still another set of reasons. All of this, we believe, was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. For the later church, none of the Gospels supersedes the other, but each stands beside the others as equally valuable and equally authoritative. How so? Because in each case the interest in Jesus is at two levels. First, there was the purely historical concern that this is who Jesus was and this is what he said and did, it is this Jesus, who was crucified and raised from the dead, whom we now worship as the risen and exalted Lord. Second, there was the existential concern of retelling this story for the needs of later communities that did not speak Aramaic but Greek, and that did not live in a basically rural, agricultural, and Jewish setting, but in Rome, or Ephesus, or Antioch, where the gospel was encountering an urban, pagan environment. In a certain sense, therefore, the Gospels are already functioning as hermeneutical models for us, insisting by their very nature that we, too, retell the same story in our own 20th century contexts. Thus these books, which tell us virtually all we know about Jesus, are nonetheless not biographies, although they are partly biographical. Nor are they like the contemporary lives of great men, although they record the life of the greatest man. They are, to use the phrase of the second-century church father Justin Martyr, the memoirs of the apostles. Four biographies could not stand side by side as of equal value. These books stand side by side because at one and the same time they record the facts about Jesus, recall the teaching of Jesus, and bear witness to Jesus. This is their nature and their genius, and this is important both for exegesis and for hermeneutics. Exegesis of the Gospels, therefore, requires us to think both in terms of the historical setting of Jesus and in terms of the historical setting of the authors. The historical context you will recall that the first task of exegesis is to have an awareness of the historical context. This means not only to know the historical context in general, but also to form a tentative, but informed, reconstruction of the situation that the author is addressing. This can become complex at times because of the nature of the Gospels as two-level documents. Historical context first of all has to do with Jesus himself. This includes both an awareness of the culture and religion of the first century, Palestinian Judaism in which he lived and taught, as well as an attempt to understand the particular context of a given saying or parable. But historical context also has to do with the individual authors, the evangelists, and their reasons for writing. We are aware that trying to think about these various contexts can be an imposing task for the ordinary reader. Furthermore, we are aware that there is probably more speculative scholarship that goes on here than anywhere else in New Testament studies. Nonetheless, the nature of the Gospels is a given, they are two-level documents whether we like it or not. We do not begin to think that we can make you experts in these matters, indeed we sometimes wonder about the experts as well. Our hope here is simply to raise your awareness level so that you will have a greater appreciation for what the Gospels are, as well as a handle on the kinds of questions you need to ask as you read them. The historical context of Jesus, in general.
it is imperative to the understanding of Jesus that you immerse yourself in the first century Judaism of which he was a part. And this means far more than knowing that the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection, they were, sad you see. One needs to know why they do not believe and why Jesus had so little contact with them. For this kind of background information there is simply no alternative to some good outside reading. Any one or all three of the following books would be of great usefulness in this regard, Joachim Jeremias, Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus, Philadelphia, Fortress, 1969, Edward Lorza, The New Testament Environment, Nashville, Abingdon, 1976, pp. 11-196, J. Duncan M. Derrett, Jesus's Audience, New York, Seabury, 1973. An especially important feature of this dimension of the historical context, but one that is often overlooked, has to do with the form of Jesus's teaching. Everyone knows that Jesus frequently taught in parables. What people are less aware of is that he used a whole variety of such forms. For example, he was a master of purposeful overstatement, hyperbole. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 29 to 30 and the parallel in Mark chapter 9 verses 43 to 48. Jesus tells his disciples to gouge out an offending eye or cut off an offending arm. Now we all know that Jesus did not really mean that. What he meant was that people are to tear anything out of their lives that causes them to sin. But how do we know that he did not really mean what he said? Because we can all recognize overstatement as a most effective teaching technique in which we are to take the teacher for what he means not for what he says. Jesus also made effective use of Proverbs Matthew chapter 6 verse 21, Mark chapter 3 verse 24, similes and metaphors Matthew chapter 10 verse 16, 5 13, poetry Matthew chapter 7 verses 6 to 8, Luke chapter 6 verses 27 to 28, questions Matthew chapter 17 verse 25, and irony Matthew chapter 16 verses 2 to 3, to name a few. For further information on this as well as for other matters in this chapter, you would do well to read Robert H. Stein's The Method and Message of Jesus's Teaching, Philadelphia, Westminster, 1978. The historical context of Jesus, in particular this is a more difficult aspect in the attempt to reconstruct the historical context of Jesus, especially so with many of his teachings, which are presented often in the Gospels without much context. The reason for this is that Jesus's words and deeds were handed on orally during a period of perhaps 30 years or more, and during this time whole Gospels were not being passed on. It was the content of the Gospels that was being passed on in individual stories and sayings pericopes. Many of these sayings were transmitted along with their original contexts. Scholars have come to call such pericopes pronouncement stories, because the narrative itself exists only for the sake of the saying that concludes it. A typical pronouncement story is Mark chapter 12 verses 13 to 17, where the context is a question about paying taxes to the Romans. It concludes with Jesus's famous pronouncement, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Can you imagine what we might have done in reconstructing an original context for that saying if it had not been transmitted with its original context? The real difficulty, of course, comes with the fact that so many of Jesus's sayings and teachings were transmitted without their contexts. Paul himself bears witness to this reality. Three times he cites sayings of Jesus 1 Corinthians 7 10, chapter 9 verse 14, Acts chapter 20 verse 35 without alluding to their original historical contexts, nor should we have expected him. Two, of these sayings, the two in 1 Corinthians are also found in the Gospels. The divorce saying is found in two different contexts that of teaching disciples in Matthew chapter 5 verses 31 to 32, and that of controversy in Matt 10 to 1 minus 19 and Mark chapter 10 verses 1 to 12.
the right to pay, saying is found in Matthew chapter 10 verse 10 and its parallel in Luke chapter 10 verse 7 in the context of sending out the 12 Matthew and the 72 Luke. But the saying in Acts is not found at all in the Gospels, so for us it is totally without an original context. It should not surprise us, therefore, to learn that many such sayings without contexts were available to the evangelists, and that it was the evangelists themselves, under their own guidance of the Spirit, who gave these sayings their present contexts. That is one of the reasons we often find the same saying or teaching in different contexts in the Gospels. That is also why sayings with similar themes, or the same subject matter, are often grouped in the Gospels in a topical way. Matthew, for example, has five large topical collections, each of these concludes with something like, and when Jesus had finished all these sayings, life in the kingdom, the so-called Sermon on the Mount, chapters. 5 to 7 instructions for the ministers of the kingdom chapter 10 verses 5 to 42 parables of the kingdom at work in the world chapter 13 verse 1 to 52 teaching on relationships and discipline in the kingdom chapter 18 verse 1 to 35 eschatology or the consummation of the kingdom chaps 23 to 25 that these are Matthian collections can be illustrated in two ways from the collection in chapter 10. 1. The context is the historical mission of the Twelve and Jesus's instructions to them as he sent them out, verses 5 to 12. In verses 16 to 20, however, the instructions are for a much later time, since in verses 5 to 6 they had been told to go only to the lost sheep of Israel, while verse 18 prophesies of their being brought before governors, kings, and the Gentiles, and none of these were included in the original mission of the Twelve. Two, these nicely arranged sayings are found scattered all over Luke's Gospel in this order, chapter 9 verse 2 to 5, chapter 10 verse 3, chapter 21 verse 12 to 17, chapter 12 verse 11 to 12, chapter 6 verse 40, chapter 12 verse 2 to 9, chapter 12 verse 51 to 53, chapter 14 verse 25 to 27, chapter 17 verse 33, chapter 10 verse 16. This suggests that Luke also had access to most of these sayings as separate units, which he then put in different contexts. Thus as you read the Gospels, one of the questions you will want to ask, even if it cannot be answered for certain, is whether Jesus's audience for a given teaching was his close disciples, the larger crowds, or his opponents. Discovering the historical context of Jesus, or who his audience was, will not necessarily affect the basic meaning of a given saying, but it will broaden your perspective and often will help in understanding the point of what Jesus said. The historical context of the evangelist At this point we are not talking about the literary context in which each evangelist has placed his Jesus materials, but about the historical context of each author that prompted him to write a gospel in the first place. Again we are involved in a certain amount of scholarly guesswork since the Gospels themselves are anonymous, in the sense that their authors are not identified by name, and we cannot be sure of their places of origin but we can be fairly sure of each evangelist's interest and concerns by the way he selected, shaped, and arranged his materials. Mark's Gospel, for example, is especially interested in explaining the nature of Jesus's Messiahship. Although Mark knows that the Messiah is the strong Son of God chapter 1 verse 1, who moves through Galilee with power and compassion chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 8 verse 26, he also knows that Jesus repeatedly kept his Messiahship hidden, see, chapter 1 verse 34, chapter 1 verse 43, chapter 3 verse 12, chapter 4 verse 11, 5 43, 7 24, 7 36, 8 26, 830. The reason for this silence is that only Jesus understands the true nature of his messianic destiny that of a suffering servant who conquers through death.
Although this is explained three times to the disciples, they too fail to understand chapter 8 verses 27 to 33, chapter 9 verses 30 to 32, chapter 10 verses 32 to 45. Like the twice-touched man chapter 8 verse 22 to 26, they need a second touch, the resurrection, for them to see clearly. That Mark's concern is the suffering servant nature of Jesus's messiahship is even more evident from the fact that he does not include any of Jesus's teaching of discipleship until after the first explanation of his own suffering in 8:31-33. The implication, as well as the explicit teaching, is clear. The cross and servanthood that Jesus experienced are also the marks of genuine discipleship. As the poet put it, it is the way the master trod. Should not the servant tread it still? All of this can be seen by a careful reading of Mark's Gospel. This is his historical context. To place it specifically is more conjectural, but we see no reason not to follow the very ancient tradition that says that Mark's Gospel reflects the memoirs of Peter and that it appeared in Rome shortly after the latter's martyrdom, at a time of great suffering among the Christians in Rome. In any case, such contextual reading and studying is as important for the Gospels as it is for the Epistles the literary context. We have already touched on this somewhat in the section on the historical context of Jesus, in particular. The literary context has to do with the place of a given pericope in the context of any one of the Gospels. To some extent this context was probably already fixed by its original historical context, which may have been known to the evangelist. But as we have already seen, many of the materials in the Gospels owe their present context to the evangelists themselves, according to their inspiration by the Spirit. Our concern here is twofold. One, to help you exegete or read with understanding a given saying or narrative in its present context in the Gospels, and two, to help you understand the nature of the composition of the Gospels as wholes, and thus to interpret any one of the Gospels itself, not just isolated facts about the life of Jesus. Interpreting the individual pericopes in discussing how to interpret the epistles, we noted that you must learn to think paragraphs. That is not quite so important with the Gospels, although it will still hold true from time to time, especially with the large blocks of teachings. As we noted at the outset, these teaching sections will indeed have some similarities to our approach with the epistles. Because of the unique nature of the Gospels, however, one must do two things here, think horizontally, and think vertically. This is simply our way of saying that when interpreting or reading one of the Gospels, one needs to keep in mind the two realities about the Gospels noted above, that there are four of them, and that they are two level documents. Think horizontally. To think horizontally means that when studying a pericope in any one gospel, one should be aware of the parallels in the other gospels. To be sure, this point must not be overdrawn, since none of the evangelists intended his gospel to be read in parallel with the others. Nonetheless, the fact that God has provided four gospels in the canon means that they cannot legitimately be read in total isolation from one another. Our first word here is one of caution. The purpose of studying the Gospels in parallel is not to fill out the story in one Gospel with details from the others. Usually such a reading of the Gospels tends to harmonize all the details and thus blur the very distinctives in each Gospel that the Holy Spirit inspired. Such, filling out, may interest us at the level of the historical Jesus, but that is not the canonical level, which should be our first concern. The basic reasons for thinking horizontally are two. First, the parallels will often give us an appreciation for the distinctives of any one of the Gospels. After all, it is precisely their distinctives that are the reason for having four Gospels in the first place. Second, the parallels will help us to be aware of the different kinds of contexts in which the same or similar materials lived in the ongoing church. We will illustrate each of these, but first, here is an important word about presuppositions.
it is impossible to read the Gospels without having some kind of presupposition about their relationships to one another, even if you have never thought about it. The most common presupposition, but the one that is the least likely of all, is that each Gospel was written independently of the others. There is simply too much clear evidence against this for it to be a live option for you as you read. Take, for example, the fact that there is such a high degree of verbal similarity among Matthew, Mark, and Luke in their narratives, as well as in their recording of the sayings of Jesus. Remarkable verbal similarities should not surprise us about the sayings of the one who spake as never man spake. But for this to carry over to the narratives is something else again, especially so when one considers, one, that these stories were first told in Aramaic, yet we are talking about the use of Greek words, two, that Greek word order is extremely free, yet often the similarities extend even to precise word order, and, three, that it is highly unlikely that three people in three different parts of the Roman Empire would tell the same story with the same words, even to such minor points of individual style as prepositions and conjunctions. Yet this is what happens over and again in the first three Gospels. This can easily be illustrated from the narrative of the feeding of the 5,000, which is one of the few stories found in all four Gospels. Note the following statistics. 1. Number of words used to tell the story Matthew chapter 157 Mark 194 Luke chapter 153 John chapter 199 2. Number of words common to all of the first three Gospels, 53 3. Number of words John has in common with all the others, 8, 5, 2, 5,000, took loaves, 12 baskets of pieces, 4. Percentages of agreement Matthew with Mark 59% Matthew with Luke chapter 44% Luke with Mark 40% John with Matthew 8.5% John with Mark 8.5% John with Luke 6.5% The following conclusions seem inevitable. John represents a clearly independent telling of the story. He uses only those words absolutely necessary to be telling the same story, and even uses a different Greek word for fish. The other three are just as clearly interdependent in some way. Those who know Greek recognize how improbable it is for two people independently to tell the same story in narrative form and have a 60% agreement in the words used, and often in the exact word order. Take as a further example the words from Mark chapter 13 verse 14 and the parallel in Matthew chapter 24 verse 15. Let the reader understand. These words can hardly have been a part of the oral tradition, it says reader, not hearer, and since in its earliest form, Mark, there is no mention of Daniel, it is unlikely to be a word of Jesus referring to Daniel. The words were therefore inserted into the saying of Jesus by one of the evangelists for the sake of his readers. It seems highly improbable that exactly the same parenthesis would have been inserted independently at exactly the same point by two authors writing independently. The best explanation of all the data is the one we suggested earlier, that Mark wrote his Gospel first, probably in part at least from his recollection of Peter's preaching and teaching. Luke and Matthew had access to Mark's Gospel and independently used it as the basic source for their own. But they also had access to all kinds of other material about Jesus, some of which they had in common. This common material, however, is scarcely ever presented in the same order in the two Gospels, a fact that suggests that neither one had access to the other's writing. Finally, John wrote independently of the other three and thus his Gospel has little material in common with them. This, we would note, is how the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Gospels. That this will help you interpret the Gospels can be seen from the following brief sample, RSV. Notice how the saying of Jesus on the, desolating sacrilege, appears when read in parallel columns. It should be noted first of all that this saying is in the Olivet Discourse in exactly the same sequence in all three Gospels.
when Mark recorded these words, he was calling his readers to a thoughtful reflection as to what Jesus meant by the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be. Matthew, also inspired by the Spirit, helped his readers by making the saying a little more explicit. The desolating sacrilege, he reminds them, was spoken about in Daniel, and what Jesus meant by, where it ought not to be, was the holy place, the temple in Jerusalem. Luke, equally inspired of the Spirit, simply interpreted the whole saying for the sake of his Gentile readers. He really lets them understand. What Jesus meant by all this was, when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Thus one can see how thinking horizontally and knowing that Matthew and Luke used Mark can help you to interpret any one of the Gospels as you read it. Similarly, awareness of Gospel parallels also helps one to see how the same materials sometimes came to be used in new contexts in the ongoing Church. Take, for example, Jesus's lament over Jerusalem, which is one of those sayings Matthew and Luke have in common that is not found in Mark. The saying appears nearly word for word in both Gospels. In Luke chapter 13 verses 34 to 35 it belongs to a long collection of narratives and teaching as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem chapter 9 51 to chapter 19 verse 10. It immediately follows the warning about Herod, which Jesus has concluded by his reply, it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. The rejection of God's messenger leads to judgment on Israel. In Matthew chapter 23 verses 37 to 39 the lament concludes his collection of seven woes on the Pharisees, the final one of which reflects the theme of the prophets being killed in Jerusalem. In this case the saying has the same point in both Gospels although it is placed in different settings. The same thing is true of many other sayings as well. The Lord's Prayer is set in both Gospels Matthew 6-7-13, Luke chapter 11 verses 2-4 RSV in contexts of teaching on prayer, although the main thrust of each section is considerably different. Note also that in Matthew it serves as a model, pray then like this, in Luke repetition is allowed, when you pray, say. Likewise note the Beatitudes Matthew. 5-3-11, Luke chapter 6 verses 20-23. In Matthew the poor, the poor in spirit, in Luke they are simply, you poor, in contrast to, you that are rich, chapter 6 verse 24. On such points most people tend to have only half a canon. Traditional evangelicals tend to read only, the poor in spirit, social activists tend to read only, you poor. We insist that both are canonical. In a truly profound sense the real poor are those who recognize themselves as impoverished before God. But the God of the Bible, who became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, is a God who pleads the cause of the oppressed and the disenfranchised. One can scarcely read Luke's Gospel without recognizing his interest in this aspect of the divine revelation see chapter 14 12 to 14, chapter 12 verse 33 to 34 with the Matthian parallel, chapter 6 verses 19 to 21. A final word here, if you are interested in the serious study of the Gospels, you will need to refer to a synopsis, a presentation of the Gospels in parallel columns. The very best of these is edited by Kurt Land, entitled Synopsis of the Four Gospels, New York, United Bible Societies, 1975. Think vertically. To think vertically means that when reading or studying a narrative or teaching in the Gospels, one should try to be aware of both historical contexts, that of Jesus and that of the Evangelist. Again, our first word here is one of caution. The purpose of thinking vertically is not primarily to study the life of the historical Jesus. That indeed should always be of interest to us. But the Gospels in their present form are the word of God to us, our own reconstructions of Jesus's life are not. And again, one should not overdo this kind of thinking.
It is only a call for the awareness that many of the gospel materials owe their present context to the evangelists, and that good interpretation may require appreciating a given saying first in its original historical context as a proper prelude to understanding that same word in its present canonical context. We may illustrate this from a passage like Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 to 16, Jesus's parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Our concern is, what does this mean in its present context in Matthew? If we first think horizontally, we will note that on either side of the parable Matthew has long sections of material in which he follows Mark very closely Matthew. 19 to 1 minus 30, chapter 20 verses 17 to 34 parallels Mark chapter 10 verses 1 to 52. At 1031 RSV, Mark had the saying, many that are first will be last, and the last first, which Matthew kept intact at chapter 19 verse 30. But right at that point he then inserted this parable, which concluded with a repetition of this saying chapter 20 verses 16, only now in reverse order. Thus in Matthew's Gospel the immediate context for the parable is the saying about the reversal of order between the first and the last. When you look at the parable proper chapter 20 verses 1 to 15, you will note that it concludes with the landowner's justification of his generosity. Pay in the kingdom, Jesus says, is not predicated on what's fair, but on God's grace. In its original context this parable probably served to justify Jesus's own accepting of sinners in light of the Pharisees' cavil against him. They think of themselves as having, borne the burden of the day, and hence worthy of more pay. But God is generous and gracious, and he freely accepts sinners just as he does the righteous. Given that as its most likely original setting, how does the parable now function in Matthew's Gospel? The point of the parable, God's gracious generosity to the undeserving, certainly remains the same. But that point is no longer a concern to justify Jesus's own actions. Matthew's Gospel does that elsewhere in other ways. Here the parable functions in a context of discipleship, where those who have forsaken all to follow Jesus are the last who have become first, perhaps indeed in contrast to the Jewish leaders, a point Matthew makes over and again. Many times, of course, thinking vertically will reveal that the same point is being made at both levels. But the illustration just given shows how fruitful such thinking can be for exegesis. Interpreting the Gospels as holds an important part of the literary context is to learn to see the kinds of concerns that have gone into the composition of each of the Gospels that make each of them unique. We have noted throughout this chapter that in reading and studying the Gospels one must take seriously not only the evangelist's interest in Jesus per se, what he did and said, but also their reasons for retelling the one story for their own readers. The evangelists, we have noted, were authors, not merely compilers. But being authors does not mean they were creators of the material, quite the opposite is true. Several factors prohibit greater creativity, including, we believe, the somewhat fixed nature of the material and the sovereign oversight of the Holy Spirit in the transmissional process. Thus they were authors in the sense that with the Spirit's help they creatively structured and rewrote the material to meet the needs of their readers. What concerns us here is to help you to be aware of each of the evangelist's compositional concerns and techniques as you read or study. There were three principles at work in the composition of the Gospels, selectivity, arrangement, and adaptation. On the one hand, the evangelists as divinely inspired authors selected those narratives and teachings that suited their purposes. It is true, of course, that simple concern for the preservation of what was available to them may have been one of those purposes. Nonetheless, John, who has fewer but considerably more expanded narratives and discourses, specifically tells us he has been very selective chapter 20 verse 30 to 31, chapter 21 verse 25. This last word chapter 21 verse 25, spoken in hyperbole, probably expresses the case for the others as well.
Luke, for example, chose not to include a considerable section of Mark chapter 6 verse 45 to chapter 8 verse 26. At the same time the evangelists and their churches had special interests that also caused them to arrange and adapt what was selected. John, for example, distinctly tells us that his purpose was patently theological, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, chapter 20 verse 31. This interest in Jesus as the Jewish Messiah is probably the chief reason that the vast majority of his material has to do with Jesus's ministry in Judea and Jerusalem, over against the almost totally Galilean ministry in the Synoptics. For Jews, the Messiah's true home was Jerusalem. Thus John knows of Jesus's having said that a prophet has no honor in his own home or country. This was originally said at the time of his rejection at Nazareth Matthew. 1357, Mark chapter 6 verse 4, Luke chapter 4 verse 24. In John's Gospel this saying is referred to as an explanation for the Messiah's rejection in Jerusalem chapter 4 verse 44 a profound theological insight into Jesus's ministry. The principle of adaptation is also what explains most of the so-called discrepancies among the Gospels. One of the most noted of these, for example, is the cursing of the fig tree Mark chapter 11 verses 12 to 14, 20 to 25, Matthew 21 18 minus 22. In Mark's gospel the story is told for its symbolic theological significance. Note that between the cursing and the withering Jesus pronounces a similar judgment on Judaism by his cleansing of the temple. However, the story of the fig tree had great meaning for the early church also because of the lesson on faith that concludes it. In Matthew's Gospel the lesson on faith is the sole interest of the story, so he relates the cursing and the withering together in order to emphasize this point. Remember, in each case this telling of the story is the work of the Holy Spirit, who inspired both evangelists. To illustrate this process of composition on a somewhat larger scale, let us look at the opening chapters of Mark chapter 1 verse 14 to chapter 3 verse 6. These chapters are an artistic masterpiece, so well constructed that many readers will probably get Mark's point even though not recognizing how he has done it. There are three strands to Jesus's public ministry that are of special interest to Mark, popularity with the crowds, discipleship for the few, and opposition from the authorities. Notice how skillfully, by selecting and arranging narratives, Mark sets these before us. After the announcement of Jesus's public ministry chapter 1 verses 14 to 15, the first narrative records the call of the first disciples. This motif will be elaborated in the next sections chapter 3 verse 13 to 19, chapter 4 verses 10 to 12, chapter 4 verses 34 to 41. His greater concern in these first two chapters is with the other two items. Beginning with chapter 1 verse 21 to chapter 1 verse 45 Mark has just four pericopes, a day in Capernaum, 1 21 minus 28 and 29 to 34, a short preaching tour the next day, 1 35 minus 39, and the story of the healing of the leper chapter 1 verses 40 to 45. The common motif throughout is the rapid spread of Jesus's fame and popularity, CVV. 27 to 28, 32 to 33, 37, 45, which culminates with Jesus's not being able to enter a town openly. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. It all seems breathtaking, yet Mark has painted this picture with only four narratives, plus his repeated phrase, and immediately, chapter 1 verse 21, 23, 28, 29, 31, 42, a phrase that is unfortunately lost in the NIV, and his starting almost every sentence with, and, which is also lost in the NIV. With that picture before us Mark next selects five different kinds of narratives that, all together, paint the picture of opposition and give the reasons for it.
Notice that the common denominator of the first four pericopes is the question, why, 2 to 7, 16, 18, 24. Opposition comes because Jesus forgives sin, eats with sinners, neglects the tradition of fasting, and breaks the Sabbath. That this last item was considered by the Jews to be the ultimate insult to their tradition is made clear by Mark appending a second narrative of this kind, 3 to 1 minus 6. We do not mean to suggest that in all the sections of all the Gospels one will be able to trace the evangelists' compositional concerns so easily. But we do suggest that this is the kind of looking at the Gospels that is needed. Some hermeneutical observations for the most part the hermeneutical principles for the Gospels are a combination of what has been said in previous chapters about the epistles and historical narratives. The teachings and imperatives given that one has done exegesis with care, the teachings and imperatives of Jesus in the Gospels should be brought into the 20th century in the same way as we do with Paul, or Peter or James, in the epistles. Even the questions of cultural relativity need to be raised in the same way. Divorce is scarcely a valid option for couples who would both be followers of Jesus, a point repeated by Paul in 1 Corinthians 7-10-11. But in a culture such as modern America, where one out of two adult converts will have been divorced, the question of remarriage should probably not be decided mindlessly and without redemptive concern for new converts. One's early assumptions about the meaning of the words of Jesus spoken in an entirely different cultural setting must be carefully examined. Likewise, we will scarcely have a Roman soldier forcing us to go a mile Matthew chapter 5 verse 41. But in this case Jesus's point, the Christian extra, is surely applicable in any number of comparable situations. An important word needs to be said here. Because many of Jesus's imperatives are set in the context of expounding the Old Testament law and because to many people they seem to present an impossible ideal, a variety of hermeneutical ploys have been offered to get around these imperatives as normative authority for the Church. We cannot take the time here to outline and refute these various attempts, but a few words are in order. An excellent overview is given in Chapter 6 of Stein's The Method and Message of Jesus's Teachings. Most of these hermeneutical ploys arose because the imperatives seem like law, and such an impossible law at that. And Christian life according to the New Testament is based on God's grace, not on obedience to law. But to see the imperatives as law is to misunderstand them. They are not law in the sense that one must obey them in order to become or remain a Christian, our salvation does not depend upon perfect obedience to them. They are descriptions, by way of imperative, of what Christian life should be like because of God's prior acceptance of us. A no retaliation ethic Matthew chapter 5 verses 38 to 42 is in fact the ethic of the kingdom, for this present age but it is predicated on God's non-retaliatory love for us, and in the kingdom it is to be, like father, like son. It is our experience of God's unconditional, unlimited forgiveness that comes first, but it is to be followed by our unconditional, unlimited forgiveness of others. Someone has said that in Christianity, religion is grace, ethics is gratitude. Hence Jesus's imperatives are a word for us, but they are not like the Old Testament law. They describe the new life, which itself is not optional of course, that one is to live out as God's loved and redeemed child. The narratives The narratives tend to function in more than one way in the Gospels. The miracle stories, for example, are not recorded to offer morals or to serve as precedents. Rather, they function in the Gospels as vital illustrations of the power of the kingdom breaking in through Jesus's own ministry. In a circuitous way they may illustrate faith, fear, or failure, but that is not their primary function.
However, stories such as The Rich Young Man Mark chapter 10 verses 17 to 22 and parallels or the request to sit at Jesus's right hand Mark chapter 10 verses 35 to 45 and parallels are placed in a context of teaching where the story itself serves as an illustration of what is being taught. It seems to us to be the proper hermeneutical practice to use these narratives in precisely the same way. Thus the point of the rich young man story is not that all Jesus's disciples must sell all their possessions to follow him. There are clear examples in the Gospels where that was not the case Luke chapter 5 verses 27 to 30, 8 to 3, Mark chapter 14 verses 3 to 9. The story instead illustrates the point of how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom, precisely because they have prior commitments to mammon and are trying to secure their lives thereby. But God's gracious love can perform miracles on the rich, too, Jesus goes on to say. The Zacchaeus story Luke chapter 19 verses 1 to 10 is an illustration of such. Again, one can see the importance of good exegesis so that the point we make of such narratives is in fact the point being made in the Gospel itself. A final, very important word this word also applies to the prior discussion of the historical context of Jesus, but it is included here because it is so crucial to the hermeneutical question. The word is this, one dare not think he or she can properly interpret the Gospels without a clear understanding of the concept of the Kingdom of God in the ministry of Jesus. For a brief, but good, introduction to this matter look at Chapter 4 in Stein's Method and Message. Here we can give only a brief sketch, along with some words about how this affects hermeneutics. First of all, you should know that the basic theological framework of the entire New Testament is eschatological. Eschatology has to do with the end, when God brings this age to its close. Most Jews in Jesus's day were eschatological in their thinking. That is, they thought they lived at the very brink of time, when God would step into history and bring an end to this age and usher in the age to come. The Greek word for the end they were looking for is eschaton. Thus to be eschatological in one's thinking meant to be looking for the end. The earliest Christians, of course, well understood this eschatological way of looking at life. For them the events of Jesus's coming, his death and resurrection, and his giving of the Spirit were all related to their expectations about the coming of the end. It happened like this. The coming of the end also meant a new beginning, the beginning of God's new age, the messianic age. The new age was also the Gospels, one story, many dimensions 144 referred to as the kingdom of God, which meant, the time of God's rule. This new age would be a time of righteousness, e.g., Isa, 11 to 4 minus 5, and people would live in peace, e.g., Isa, 2 to 2 minus 4. It would be a time of the fullness of the Spirit, Joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 30, when the new covenant spoken of by Jeremiah would be realized, Jer, 31 to 31 minus 34, 32 to 38 minus 40. Sin and sickness would be done away with, e.g., Zech, 13 to 1, Isa, 53 to 5. Even the material creation would feel the joyful effects of this new age, e.g., Isa, 11 to 6 minus 9. Thus when John the Baptist announced the coming of the end to be very near and baptized God's Messiah, eschatological fervor reached fever pitch. The Messiah was at hand, the one who would usher in the new age of the Spirit, Luke chapter 3 verses 7 to 17. Jesus came and announced that the coming kingdom was at hand with his ministry, e.g., Mark chapter 1 verses 14 to 15, Luke chapter 17 verses 20 to 21. He cast out demons, worked miracles, and freely accepted the outcasts and sinners, all signs that the end had begun, e.g., Luke chapter 11 verse 20, Matt, 11 to 2 minus 6, Luke chapter 14 verse 21, 15 to 1 minus 2. Everyone kept watching him to see if he really was the coming one.
would he really bring in the messianic age with all of its splendor? Then suddenly he was crucified, and the lights went out. But no, there was a glorious sequel. On the third day he was raised from the dead and he appeared to many of his followers. Surely now he would restore the kingdom to Israel, Acts chapter 1 verse 6. But instead he returned to the Father and poured out the promised Spirit. Here is where problems come for the early church and for us. Jesus announced the coming kingdom as having arrived with his own coming. The Spirit's coming in fullness and power, with signs and wonders, and the coming of the new covenant were signs that the new age had arrived. Yet the end of this age apparently had not yet taken place. How were they to understand this? Very early, beginning with Peter's sermon in Acts 3, the early Christians came to realize that Jesus had not come to usher in the final end, but the beginning of the end, as it were. Thus they came to see that with Jesus's death and resurrection, and with the coming of the Spirit, the blessings and benefits of the future had already come. In a sense, therefore, the end had already come. But, in another sense the end had not yet fully come. Thus it was already, but not yet. The early believers, therefore, learned to be a truly eschatological people. They lived between the times, that is, between the beginning of the end and the consummation of the end. At the Lord's table they celebrated their eschatological existence by proclaiming, the Lord's death until he comes, 1 Corinthians 11:26. Already they knew God's free and full forgiveness, but they had not yet been perfected Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 to 14. Already victory over death was theirs 1 Corinthians 3:22, yet they would still die Philippians 3:20-22. Already they lived in the spirit, yet they still lived in the world where Satan could attack Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 17. Already they had been justified and faced no condemnation Romans chapter 8 verse 1, yet there was still to be a future judgment 2 Corinthians, 5 10. They were God's future people, they had been conditioned by the future. They knew its benefits, lived in light of its values, but they, as we, still had to live out these benefits and values in the present world. Thus the essential theological framework for understanding the New Testament looks like this, the hermeneutical key to much in the New Testament, and especially the ministry and teaching of Jesus, is to be found in this kind of tension. Precisely because the kingdom, the time of God's rule, has been inaugurated with Jesus' own coming we are called to life in the kingdom, which means life under his lordship, freely accepted and forgiven, but committed to the ethics of the new age, and to seeing them worked out in our own lives and world in this present age. Thus when we pray, thy kingdom come, we pray first of all for the consummation. But because the kingdom we long to see consummated has already begun to come, the same prayer is full of implications for the present.